How is the truth about God related to the gospel the way I understand it? I have to put in that stipulation. I believe my understanding is a biblical understanding. But because not everybody might agree with my understanding, I want to say my understanding of the gospel. All right, maybe by the time I'm finished, we'll see that we're all in agreement. Maybe. But I want to build on two premises. Two premises, and I'll tell you right at the beginning what they are. First premise is that Jesus Christ is, always was from the beginning of his existence, the true, literal, begotten Son of God. I believe this. I believe the Bible teaches it. And I believe that if you don't understand this, you cannot properly understand the gospel. I believe everybody who is preaching the gospel and who is preaching about righteousness by faith and does not believe this is not preaching it properly. It is necessary to understanding the gospel. The second thing I want to build on, the second premise, is that the Holy Spirit is actually the literal life, the life force of the Father and Jesus Christ. Not a third separate individual and I believe also that if you don't understand this you're bound to be distorted in your understanding of what Jesus did for us and of the gospel and I'm going to demonstrate why I think this this morning now when I say Jesus was the only begotten Son of God the literal begotten Son of God here is my understanding and it has something to do a little bit with the question that brother Kelly asked brother Howard I hope I can address that question a little more fully in this presentation. I believe that Jesus took, as the Bible says, our, our fallen nature. I believe he took our fallen nature fully, absolutely. But I also believe that the Bible teaches that every intelligent being possesses, possesses two natures, two natures. We possess a physical nature and we possess a spiritual nature. Now I believe that man's body is fallen, it's degenerate, it's dying, it's weak, it's diseased, it's inclined to self-indulgence, man's physical nature. And I believe that Jesus inherited this physical nature fully because the Bible says in Galatians 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. That body that Jesus came into came from Mary. It was made of a woman. Romans 1 and verse 4 says, he was, and verse 3 says, he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. But when it says he was made according to the flesh, what does it imply? It implies that there was also one part according to the spirit. Now, if you say Jesus was not exactly like me physically, I will tell you that you are not saying the truth because the Bible tells me he was made of a woman. He was made of the seed of David. In the Hebrews, it tells us that he took on our nature. But who was it that dwelt inside this temple? Of flesh when the Bible says sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me who is the me that me is the Son of God that me is the one who came from heaven that me is the one who came to dwell in this degenerate body what was the nature of this me this person that came to dwell inside that body who was he and what was his spiritual nature? Because he left his body behind, right? The Bible says that he left his glory behind. He was in the form of God, Philippians 2. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he took upon himself the form of a man. He took upon himself the place of a servant and was made in the likeness of sinful men, right? But who was the me that came from heaven? When Jesus came from heaven, was he still the son of God? Now clearly the body was not the son of God. The body was the son of Mary. Who or what was the son of God? When the, when the apostle says, we saw his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father. Was that the son of Mary? Or was that 
the Son of God. When the Bible says the people that dwelt in darkness have seen a great light, was that the Son of Mary or was that the Son of God? So my understanding is that his mind, as A.T. June says, he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, but not in the likeness of sinful mind. Don't bring his mind into it. That's what A.T. June says. And so the Bible tells us that, the Bible tells us of Jesus Christ. Thou hast loved righteousness. But what? Hated iniquity. This can be said of only one human being who ever walked on this earth, that he was born hating iniquity and loving righteousness. He was not trained to do good. He was born good. We are born, the Bible says, we are born... Well, somebody says that this is only talking about David. David says he was born in sin, shape and in iniquity. But you know that we are born carnal. We are born in need of the new birth. Every person who is born on this planet has to be born again, excepting one. So what I'm really saying, I believe that this was necessary. Absolutely necessary for our salvation. I can tell you why from the very beginning. I can give you an illustration that makes perfect sense. If you drop into a, a quicksand pit and somebody is coming to help you, he cannot jump in the pit with you unless he has a solid hold on something firm. Isn't that right? He must be firmly rooted on something solid before he jumps in the pit because if he gets in the pit with you, you are both going to sink. Jesus, when he came to this earth, came to rescue humanity. He had to have a way to get us out of the hole. And that hole, that way to escape could not be humanity. Humanity cannot rescue humanity. Humanity is already fallen, is already sitting in this hole. Humanity, more of the same garbage cannot help. You need something outside of humanity to lift humanity out of this hole. So, I'm going to explain why this is so important in just a moment. But I wanted to make that point right from the start. Second point I want to make. Jesus possessed, when he came here, the mind of the Son of God. But he did not possess the power of God. He did not possess it. Jesus could not leap over tall buildings with a single bound. Jesus by himself, by his own power, could not have walked on water. He could not have raised the dead because the Bible says he left his glory behind. Where his abilities were concerned, he was exactly like you and me, plus or minus nothing. He had no power that we cannot possess. We have to make a distinction between power to do things and the nature. How do I make a distinction? I have to go back to the illustration of animals. That probably is the best way to illustrate it. You have the, the, the nature of a wolf. A wolf by nature is aggressive and its instinct is to tear living things to pieces. You also have the nature of a lamb. Now you'd say that, why does a lamb behave so gently and so meekly? And the wolf is so aggressive. Does the lamb have more power than the wolf? I mean in terms of strength, the wolf is probably stronger, right? But the lamb has something and it's not, I wouldn't re refer to it as power. I would refer to it as nature. His intrinsic way of behavior is gently and meekly, uncomplainingly. It's a nature, it's the way he is. Now I believe that Jesus by nature had this gentle, loving, pure, holy disposition that belongs to divinity alone. But he had no power to do things, walk on water, calm the sea. All of this was done by God. Like, because the Bible tells us, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit who went about doing good because God was with him. I think that's found in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, if I'm not mistaken. 
But it says he went about doing good for God was with him. Maybe I have the wrong reference, but I think that's where it is. So we see that what I'm saying is that Jesus was, while he was here, he was God in his nature, but not in his power. He was, I should put it another way. He was divine in his nature. But he was not divine in terms of the power that he possessed. Now I'll tell you why this is so important in just a moment. You will see from this, brothers and sisters, why Jesus had to be the Son of God. Because one of the things we learn about God is that God is omniscient. There are certain attributes that we, we, we say belong to God. God is omniscient, He's omnipotent, He's omnipresent. Even at this moment, He is in every part of the universe at the same time. When Jesus was a little, a little speck of life growing in Mary's belly, did he know everything? Was he everywhere at the same time? Did he have all power, this little speck of protoplasm inside this woman's belly, did it, have, did it possess all the power in the universe? No. And that tells you that Jesus could not the, the God the Father could not have done what Jesus did because it is impossible for God to stop being omnipresent it's impossible for God to stop upholding the universe by his power it's impossible for God to put aside his power but it was possible for the Son of God because although the Son of God inherits his nature from his father he receives the power of the Father by designation God gives him his power and therefore God can take back that power. But his nature belonged to Christ intrinsically. It is who he was. How do I know that God can take the power from Jesus and give it back to him? Because in Philippians 2, it says it was taken from him and he became a man. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, God tells us that when the end comes, it tells us that God has put all things under the feet of his son. In Matthew 28, Jesus says, all power is given unto me where? In heaven and in earth God can give that power to Christ but the nature belongs to Christ that's what makes him the Son of God he possesses his father's pure holy nature now I'm going to explain why this was necessary why it was necessary for Jesus to be this kind of person now brother Howard last night explained about the two Adams and I'm going to go back and do a little revision of what he said last night. Just a short revision. And I might have to move about a little bit. So I'm asking the people on the camera to be aware of that. I just want to illustrate what I'm doing a little graphically. And so I might use my hands because I don't have a board here. But we know that God, as, as Howard said last night, and as the Bible tells us clearly, Jesus is called the last Adam. And there is a reason why the Bible calls him the last Adam. God is trying to say something to us by using the term Adam. He's saying there's something Adam had in common or Jesus, something Jesus Christ has in common with Adam. Now, they were not, Jesus was not placed in a garden with a beautiful woman. They don't have that in common. And in fact, in Romans chapter 5, it makes it clear in what way Jesus is, is, is Adam. Adam was, was made the head of a race of beings. Adam is the father of a, a race of beings. And the relationship of being the head of this be, these beings affected that race in such a way that what Adam did affected all his descendants. In the book of Romans we are taught that Jesus is the last Adam in the sense that what he did also affects all his descendants so he's Adam because he's a father of a race of beings that's what the word Adam signifies I'll ask you to just look at some verses here to just support what I'm saying go to Romans chapter 5 and let's just read two verses before we move on Romans chapter 5 I'll read 
verse 14 and 15 first and then a couple of others. It says in 14 and 15, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure... What other word could we use for the word figure? He was a representation, the similitude, or the type. Adam was a type of him that was to come. There you see, it, we are told that Adam and Christ are counterparts. Adam is a representation of Christ. It goes on. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one man, for if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. We'll go down to verses 18 and 19, which are the key verses. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon who? Are you there with me? Judgment came upon all men to condemnation by one man's offense. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Then the next verse says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So the point I'm making here is that it's Paul's point. What Paul is saying is that just as Adam's life had the ability to condemn an entire race of people, so the life of the last Adam has the ability to justify and to save an entire race of people. In this, Jesus and Adam are counterparts. You know, there's a verse in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 that I did not understand until I began to understand this. That verse says, Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Now, even if you're a Trinitarian or you're not a Trinitarian, that verse doesn't seem to make any sense because you know that the Father in the Godhead is, a, is God the Father. The son who was born is not the everlasting father. And yet here it is said that his name shall be called the everlasting father. Why? Because Jesus has been made the father. He has been put in the position of being the second father of the human race. He is truly the everlasting father of a new race of beings. And I'm going to explain that a little better. Now try to follow me in this illustration. I'm going to point out something to you that I'm going to, I'm going to paint a scenario that I'm asking you to try to follow. Step by step, it's important that you follow my, my reasoning. And I'm going to do something that Brother Howard did. If at any point you, you can't understand what I'm saying, or it doesn't make sense, I'm just going to ask you to put up your hand. I don't want, I won't start an argument. And I know you, you don't want to start an argument either. But just in case you don't understand or it does not make sense to you, please put up your hand. I ask you, please. Don't do like those people in Germany. Be like Jamaicans. <laughs> if I say to them, put up your hand if you don't understand. Man, hands go shooting up. But other places, they just sit there and disagree. And they don't put up their hands. And I think everything is okay. And it isn't. So I hope you'll be like Jamaicans this morning. Now, when Adam sinned, even before that, here is the one principle I want us to start with. Something that the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus tells us this. There is none good but one. That is who? God. Divinity alone is good. Now, if you can accept this, if you can accept this, it means that anywhere that God is not in control, the only possible consequence is evil. There are not gradations, there are not grade, gra graded levels of goodness and evil. Like somebody is a little bit good and somebody is more good. If God alone is good, then the absolute truth is that the only possibility of goodness in any degree at all is a relationship with God. 
So when Lucifer decided, I don't want God in my life, he did not gradually begin, begin to become evil. He instantly became absolutely evil. And it may be that hypocrisy and practice enabled him to pretend for a while that he was not totally evil. But he was. And what Lucifer is today, he was the day he turned away from God. Only that the longer he has lived and the more time has progressed, the more his true nature has been revealed. You see what I'm saying? But what he was, what he is today, was there from the day that he turned against God. Now the universe at the beginning was perfectly good and it, this means what? It was perfectly filled with the presence and life of God. There's no other way the, the universe could have been good, right? Even the world, when God made the world, the Bible says of the world that God saw everything that he had made and it was good. From the, the tiniest microbe to, the, to the, the intelligent human beings that he created. Everything was good. Why? Because everything was in the right relationship with God. The serpent persuaded Eve that life independent of God was a better option. Now how I'd use the word separation from God and I'm going to modify what he said a little bit and I'm going to use the word independent of God first of all because what Eve chose to do what Satan persuaded Eve to do was that he could she could act independently of God and that this would this would be to her advantage if she chose to behave outside of God to live her life outside of God she would become a better person she would become as God himself and she believed the serpent now the moment Adam and Eve stepped away from God, they stepped over onto the dark side of the universe. At first, there was light everywhere. But Lucifer divided the universe in two. And this division was not a physical division, it was like an ideological division. Think about what I'm saying. Lucifer said on this side, if you live without God, you will be better. In fact, you will learn the principle of independence, which is God's principle. And he says, you are better here. And he created a universe, a part of the universe, in which existed this life without God. Adam and Eve were on this side. With God, united to God. But then, Lucifer persuaded Adam and Eve that over on this side is better and they believed him and so they chose to step over the line and they stepped into the dark side of the universe now instantly Adam and Eve should have dropped dead well let me let me take that back instantly they, they began to die instantly they should have been totally separated from God why because God has built on one principle and it is this, the whole universe stands on this principle. God's government stands on this principle. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom to choose. God gives you the right to choose. He never forces or compels. That is not his way. So when God says to man, serve me and you will live. Reject me and you will die. God has to respect his own integrity. God has to respect even Satan. Satan says, I have a way over here that is better than your way. And if you give people freedom to choose, they will automatically choose my way because my way is better than your way. So Adam steps over and he says, I choose. What does God have to do? God has to leave Adam alone to the choice that he has made. I'll tell you more. God cannot interfere with Adam and Adam's choice. Does that make sense? Because if he interferes, Satan has the right to say, Foul! They have made a choice. Why are you still interfering with them? Does that make sense? Satan has the right to say, God, stay away from them. They have made a choice. And according to your own rules as a judge and the authority in this universe, you have no right to them anymore. So man is in a dilemma. Now I want you to understand something. I'm showing you the picture that exists because Christ has not yet been brought into the picture. This is man's 
true condition and we have not understood it why because we have always viewed man's condition with Christ in the formula so we have never appreciated what our true condition is and what Christ did for us because we are factoring in what Christ did to understand the truth we have to take Christ out of the picture then we get to understand the truth so man steps across and man is dead he has no hope here is man and without Christ his probation is closed in fact he doesn't have any probation at all here is man and he's going to die and when he dies how long is he going to die for forever there's no such thing as a resurrection because Christ is not yet in the picture there's no resurrection man has brought death upon humanity and everybody born of this man on this side is already dead if he can live long enough to give birth to anybody everybody over here is dead this is the state of humanity the only possibility is man now has to make a decision I don't really want Satan anymore I'm going back to God freedom of choice so man has to step back over the line and if he does this there is hope but I'm going to ask a question and I want to see if you are thinking along with me why is it impossible for man to step back over the line thank you brother David because without the Holy Spirit nothing good is in man and God cannot influence him by the Holy Spirit because God cannot interfere with the choice that he has made so man is over here and he has no hope he cannot make the choice to come over here because the carnal mind is what enmity against God he's God's enemy he hates God he fears God he has no desire for God on this side and so he's hopelessly lost that is man's condition without Christ you want to know if this is true take a take a step a few years into the future and consider what will happen when probation closes and the Spirit of God is withdrawn from the world the Bible says men will seek death they will gnaw their tongues for pain and they will blaspheme the God of heaven but they will not repent because there is no Spirit of God to draw them to repentance these people will be in the position where Adam was supposed to be that day that he turned against God they are in the condition that the entire human race belongs in except for one thing in the garden God said to the serpent I am going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed God introduced something into the picture something unnatural that Satan never expected he spoke about a seed that was to come the woman out of the woman was to come somebody who would destroy this condition that seemed impossible to resolve what God did brothers and sisters was produce another human being a human being who would on behalf of the entire race step back over that line man he was going to do what was impossible to do to step back over that line because somebody from this race somebody had to choose to step back over the line that's the first thing he had to do and the second thing he had to do he had to find a way to bring people with him over the line because if he steps back over the line then he makes a choice for himself but what about all of those who are over there right he has to find a way to bring bring them with him as well that's what the plan of salvation is about it's about Christ choosing again for himself and for the entire humanity and when you understand it it's a plan too marvelous for words now of course we know from the moment man sinned that instant Christ stepped in the middle and even though Christ did not actually carry out the plan until 4,000 years later the Bible tells us he is the Lamb of God slain from when when from the foundation of the world I think you're just shy I can't believe that you don't know that verse I think you're all very shy people but let me see if I can get you out of your shell 
He's the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13 and verse 8 tells us that. So Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice began to come into play. We began to benefit from it even before Jesus died. We began to draw from the bank before the money was de deposited, right? So we have seen the world since Adam sinned wrapped in grace. Grace has been at work. So to these devils over on this side, God's Spirit was still working on them. You see what I'm saying? We have never been without the Spirit of God because the grace of God in Christ intervened and the consequences did not fall on us that day. But they had to fall on Christ. They had to fall on Christ because if they did not fall on Christ, he could not have made the decision. He could not have been in the position where we belong to be where we belonged, so he could take us back over across that line. Are you understanding what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? So at some time, Jesus had to be put in a position where his probation was closed. The Spirit of God was taken from him. He was placed in the position where Adam belonged in that garden. And in that condition, he had to make a decision to step back over the line. Hallelujah for such a Savior. And this tells you something about Christ. If he was just like me, man, which of us can take away the Spirit of God from any of us? Can you make one good decision? You're crazy. Only God is good. Only God is good. Only God can have the Spirit of God taken from him and still be good. Only divinity can do that. Put an angel on the cross and take the Spirit of God from him. He would have blasphemed and turned to evil instantly. Even an angel who had been worshipping at the throne of God for 10 billion years. Take him and put him on the cross. Threaten him with everlasting death. Take the Spirit of God from him and he will turn to evil. He will turn to selfishness right at that moment. Take any human being, no matter how good he has been. Take Enoch, take Elijah, take Daniel, take Moses, take John the Baptist. Put them on the cross and take the Spirit of God from them and see what happens. But God put his son there. God put him where Adam, Adam belonged. And I'm going to say this. Please consider the, the, the following facts. Calvary was deliberately set up. To be a counterpart of Eden. To, to be, the, to be the, 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 the mirror of Eden in reverse. Think about it. Adam was put in a garden. A beautiful garden. Perfect. He came to the tree. And there Satan waited for him. Jesus also started his final temptation in a garden. It was called the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he came to the tree. But the tree that Adam came to was a living tree, flourishing and blooming. The tree that Christ came to was a dead tree. A symbol of the humanity that Christ represented. Adam was in the, in the bloom of strength, full of life and vigor, intellectual power. Jesus was a, an emaciated, beaten, bruised, sleep-deprived human being, dying physically when he came to that tree. And there, just as in the garden, the serpent waited, there he waited at the cross. The name of the place was Golgotha, the place of the skull. A representation of the dead, lifeless humanity that Christ represented. In the garden, the serpent said to the woman, If you eat of this tree, if you disobey God, you will live forever. On the tree, he said to Christ, If you obey God, you will die forever. It's a mirror image in reverse. God is trying to tell us that at the cross was the second time that humanity came to the place of destiny. On the cross. The first Adam destroyed us. The second one came back to the place of temptation, the place of test. And he saved us. God took away his spirit from him. He had to. If God never took his spirit from Christ, then he was not treating him as we deserve. He was not put in the place where Adam deserved to be if God did not take the spirit from him. God had to take away his spirit from Christ. 
That's why we see that the Son of God was put at risk. God risked the life and the destiny of His Son. Because when He took away the Spirit of God from His own Son and left Him alone to human strength with only divine mind, only His good nature to take Him through, He did take a risk. But you know, God, Jesus proved to the universe that God is good. Take away God's power. Take away God's spirit. Place him on a cross and threaten him with everlasting death. And God is still good. Hallelujah. And he proved to Satan and he proved to the universe that Satan is a liar. In God there is no evil. Divinity is good. So when he was put on the cross, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did not even know that this was coming. But in spite of that, he never wavered from the love that was in his heart. And he said, I choose God. And I choose the salvation of these people, even if I die forever. And in doing this, he stepped back over the line. Hallelujah. Now, one man is free. What about the rest of humanity? One man has made a decision, but what about the rest of us? The first Adam inflicted us with his disease by passing on his life to us physically, by sexual reproduction. All of us have received Adam's life and because we received it over on this side, we all are born without the Spirit of God needing to be born again. But this man has stepped across. Now he has a need also. Following the same principle and the same rule, this man now has to find a way to give birth to people. He's the father of a race, but he has to give birth to children. But guess what? He's not trying to produce a new race. He's trying to save a race that already exists. And the problem with this race is that they have no, no spirit of God in their minds. They are born without the spirit of God. So he has to find a way to give his life, to pass on his life to these people, just as Adam passed on his physical life to these people. He has to find a way to pass on his life. If Jesus were on the earth, how many people could have received his life? If he had remained on earth in his present form, how many people? Well, I, draw, I, I modify that as a one. Only himself. He could, have, he, could have had, he could have had this victory for one person. Only himself. He had to be able to do something else. He had to find a way to become such a being that he could literally impart that life, that life of victory, that new human life that was now united to divinity, that had conquered sin and conquered death. He had to find a way to pass that life on to other people. And it had to be his life, not somebody else's life. Follow the parallel. Just as Adam gave us his life, so the second Adam has to give us his life. Follow the parallel. If you don't understand this, you make a, you make a mockery of what the Bible is trying to say. We received the first life by inheritance. We became condemned by inheritance. How do we become righteous? Same principle, inheritance. We inherit that life from Christ. So Christ had to find a way to give us this life. And the Bible tells us clearly how it happens. Let's read a couple of verses. Go to John 7 and verse 39. And this takes me to the second principle that I outlined. That the Holy Spirit is what? The literal life of Jesus Christ. It's the life of God and the Father. It's not a different person. It's the actual life force that comes from Christ and the Father. John chapter 7. I want to read from verse 37 down to verse 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, 
for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified whatever the Holy Ghost is it cannot be given until Jesus is glorified what is this glorification of Jesus and why is it necessary for the Holy Spirit to be given some people think it's just a matter that Jesus Jesus went back to heaven and says father please give them the Holy Spirit and so God sent this third person to come and, and be with us then Jesus need not have gone through what he did then the Holy Spirit should have been the one who, come, who came and, and did all this for us because you destroy the illustration. We receive Adam's literal life by inheritance. To follow the parallel, we have to receive Jesus' life literally by inheritance. It has to be the life of Jesus. It cannot be another person. Adam did not sin and Adam's brother gave us his life. It was Adam's own life that was passed on. When Jesus lived righteously, it has to be Jesus' own righteous life that we inherit. Man, I wish we could all understand and believe it. I, this has made a drastic change in my life, in my understanding of God and righteousness, all my life. Like I said yesterday, my focus was to labor to be better. I thought my works my deeds my efforts were making me gradually better the truth is we become righteous by birth it's a question of inheritance it's a question of inheritance we become righteous by inheriting the life of christ christians and sinners are not just two are not just the same kinds of people who have different degrees of of good behavior no Christians and sinners are two different kinds of beings. One set of people live in the land of death. There's no life in them. They put on a form of godliness. They have righteous appearing actions, but there's no life in them. They might go to church on Sabbath. They might pay tithe. They might dress up nicely. They might give away money and goods to the poor. But unless they are born again, Every deed is actuated by selfish motives and it is really the principle of death at work in these people. They are on one side. On the other side are those who are born again. They possess the life of Christ. It's a different kind of person. These people are God's people not because of what they have done. It's because they possess the life of Christ. And of course, this life is working in them to produce good deeds because it's impossible for Christ to be in a person and that life be not manifested that's why John says in first John 2 and verse 4 he that said I know him and keep it not his commandments is a liar you're not telling the truth because it's impossible to know him and not be living in harmony with his will that's why John says he that is born of God does not commit sin why for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. These are, not, these, are not, these are not results that are brought about by human effort. They are the consequence of being born again. The more I understand this, the more I realize how much we 20th century Christians have produced many ways of counterfeiting the new birth. We have accepted secondhand mongrelized Christianity because there's one thing that we understand that that the new birth is the gift of God in Christ but at the same time God is uncompromising God does not give himself to those who will not give themselves to him and it's easier to make a pretense of being a Christian and give God partial service in our mind without giving ourselves entirely so we tell ourselves we are Christians because we give him certain kinds of behavior and we think or we hope that this will give us a chance to squeeze into the kingdom someday not until the time of trouble comes and the crisis comes upon us that we can understand that what we had was never good enough because only the life of God is good enough to qualify us to stand before God only God is good enough to face God and if we come with any other hope or expectation then I would say God help us but I realize that not even God can help us at that point 
I really wonder when I come to understand this. Well, I was ignorant for years, but when I think about this, I really wonder, man, why would I ever want any other way? How did I try and strive and fail? Man, that's a dead end street. How much more simple and beautiful that God says, I give you this gift in Jesus Christ. If you will have it, it is yours. Man, all I have to do is thank God for his goodness and tell him, take my life. I don't have anything good to give, but if you want it, take it, and he will. There's something I want to share tomorrow. I hope you are here. But that will clarify a little more why it is that we are in this condition. But anyway, so what I'm saying is, these two, on these two concepts, these two principles, these two prim premises related to the Godhead are necessary for us to understand this truth of righteousness by faith. A, Jesus had to be a human being completely, just like us. But he had to have a pure mind, and it had to be his by nature. He could not have been born with a carnal mind as we are. Otherwise, it would have been impossible for him to make that choice. Because God had to put him where he had no help from God. So he had to have a different mind. But he had to be like us, exactly like us, because God could not send a different kind of being to represent humanity. He had to send another human being in the same position where Adam was to represent humanity. So these things make us see very beautifully and clearly Jesus had to have the nature of man with a mind of divinity. And I don't believe that if you believe in if you believe Jesus was God himself, God the Almighty, it doesn't make sense. One, body, one person said to me one time, you know, Jesus was God and he could not lose his power. So he had all the power of God Almighty. Even when he was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was still God Almighty. I say, you mean that when he was in the, in, in the grave, he was still omniscient? You know what omniscience is, right? You know all things at the same time. This person was telling me that even the dead Christ in the grave still knew all things. What kind of person are they making out Christ to be? You're taking him, taking him totally out of the realm of humanity. You're putting him somewhere where I really can't reach or relate to this person. They're trying to say Jesus put on a pretense of being a human being, but he had a secret super-powered engine hidden there and of course he says I never used it and you're supposed to be able to relate to that and understand how he is he was just like me they have put him in a place where he doesn't make any sense at all on the other hand I always believe that Jesus was just like me he came with a carnal mind a carnal nature I believe that for many years Back in Jamaica, my father and I had many fights over it. We, we argued and argued. Sometimes our Sabbaths were very interesting. Because I had listened to all the tapes from the independent ministries and they said Jesus was exactly like us because he was my example. They never said he was my savior. They said he was my example. And you know with an example you say, he takes one step, I take one. He takes another step, I take another. Just follow his, the pattern and follow and everything will be all right. Sounds simple. Okay, fine. Try to do it and you'll find it's not so simple. Because you are a dog, you're a wolf trying to be a sheep. And someday the wool is going to fall off and your true nature shows through. What I didn't realize was that I did not need an example. I needed a savior. I needed somebody to do what I could not do. And when he had done it to say, here, I give it to you. I'm going to live through you and make it possible for you. I needed a savior. And one day I started asking myself a question. Well, if Jesus was exactly like me, plus or minus nothing, where was God's son? That means I could have been Christ. And as blasphemous as that thought is, it intruded itself into my mind because I could not see any logical reason if he was exactly like me why I could not have been Christ. Furthermore, I could not see why 
Every man who has ever been born sinned except one, and yet he was just the same like the rest of us. It does not make logical, or, logical sense. And I was happy when I went to the Bible and found verses there that made me know it's not true. Listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And as we read these verses, you know, you ask yourself, what is John trying to say here? 1 John chapter 1. The first two verses, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us what did they see was it just a human life man if that was just a human life john was getting off his head he says the eternal life that was with the father that which was from the beginning was manifested to us and we saw it we saw that eternal life which was with the Father. This was no mere human existence. In Jesus was a glory that the world had never seen before he came. Praise the Lord. So, this is where my understanding of the God that has taken me. And for myself personally, brothers and sisters, I have found it to be a wonderful help in my spiritual life. I've learned to appreciate God and His Son far, far better. And I've come to see in a, in a practical way why the truth about God is such a vital message. But let's not leave it where, it, where many people have taken it, into a, 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 a doctrinal theory. Let us go beyond and see the, the conclusion, the logical conclusion of this message that it takes us to the place where we come to see and understand what God did for us in Christ Jesus that is the acid test of any doctrine how does it relate to the truth of what God did in Jesus applying this test man I've appreciated Jesus more than I ever could or ever did in my life more than that I've never heard or read any book any literature where some of these things were explained you know why people cannot understand it because they believe in a trinity. The Trinitarian God cannot perform what I was trying to express today. It's not possible for a Trinitarian God. And I'm sorry if there's anybody here who believes in the trinity. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just trying to express what I'm feeling in my heart. And hopefully if you have listened to me, you can see my reasoning. Another time probably is another time to discuss what the Bible teaches about the Trinity or about the Godhead, but that, not at this moment. I'm just saying these are the implications of believing the truth. And I hope that by God's grace, all of us, well, I didn't see any hand go up. I don't know if you're being Germans or Jamaicans, <laughs> but I'm assuming that you all understood. And if you did, I have nothing to do but to say praises be to our Father. I hope all of us might not only be able to apply this to ourselves personally, but be able to share with other people. God bless you. I'm going to invite you to... Well, Brother Howard is going to come and sing a song with me before we have a closing prayer. Many years have long rest perfect peace within my breast and I often sought the Lord alone in tears but I would not pay the price would not make the sacrifice so I wandered on and on for many years. Let me lose my.
my life and find it, Lord, in Thee. May all self be slain, my friends, see only Thee. Though it costs me grief or pain, I will find my life again. If I lose my life and find it, Lord, in Thee. Then one day, while bowed in prayer, Jesus whispered to me there, Take the cross and follow me to Calvary. Oh, how hard it was to die Just for self to crucify And to lose my life And find it, Lord, in me Let me lose my life And find it, Lord self be slain my friends see only thee though it cost me grief or pain I will find my life again if I lose myself and find it Lord in thee And find it, Lord, in Thee. May all self be slain, my friends, see only Thee. Though it costs me grief and pain, I will find. If I lose myself and find it, Lord, in Thee, though it cost me grief or pain, I will find my life again. If I lose myself and find. Lord, in Thee.